All right, so let's talk about some pneumonia. We're going to talk about some other conditions that can cause respiratory distress. It's acute infection, all right, of the lower respiratory tract and causes lung inflammation and fluid to build up or pus-filled alveoli from the infection. Leads to an extreme ventilation disturbance as well as a poor gas exchange because, as you can see, instead of an open air sac, okay, instead of an open air sac, which you see, all right, normally it's filled with pus and infectious fluid. And the ability to try to exchange gas through that thick pus is almost virtually impossible. So as these air sacs fill with pus and it escalates up the airway tract, this patient becomes more and more and more short of breath. Signs and symptoms, okay, of pneumonia can be malaise or just kind of general overall pain or discomfort. Decreased appetite, fever, cough, dyspnea. Going to be less frequent in the elderly because they're kind of already dyspneic. Tachypnea, tachycardia to indicate infection as well as chest pain due to the overexertion of the accessory muscles. Decreased chest wall movement, shallow respirations, splinting of the thoracic by patient with their arm. Crackles, localized wheezing, bronchi heard over the auscultation, altered mental status due to the hypoxia, especially in the elderly, diaphoresis, cyanosis, as well as a SAT under 94%. You would not expect the patient to have a short-acting beta-2 agonist medication in a meter dose inhaler or small volume nebulizer for this condition, nor would you necessarily consider their use unless indications of bronchoconstriction are present. Okay, a pulmonary embolus. Patients at risk of a PE are those who experience long periods of immobility, those with heart disease, recent surgeries, long bone fractures, or venous pooling associated with pregnancy, cancer, DVTs, or what they call deep vein thrombosis, estrogen therapy, clotting disorders, all right, excessive platelet count, history of previous pulmonary embolus, or those who actually smoke. Based on the ventilation and perfusion ratio, pulmonary embolus creates cellular hypoxia through a disturbance on the perfusion side of blocking blood flow to the, those particular air sacs or alveoli. Okay, with a pulmonary embolus are often nonspecific and non-diagnostic due to a sudden onset of unexplained shortness of breath, signs of difficulty in breathing or respiratory distress, rapid breathing, sudden onset of sharp stabbing chest pain, predominantly during inhalation, cough, fast heart rate, fast breathing, syncope or fainting, cold moist skin, the patient becomes restless, anxious, or even a sense of impending doom, decrease in blood pressure or hypotension, which is a late sign, okay, and then cyanosis can be severe, which is also a late sign, Distended neck veins or JVD, which is also a late sign. And then you have crackles, fever, decreased SpO2 under 94, as well as signs of complete circulatory collapse. Monitor the patient for signs of respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, hypotension, poor perfusion, or cardiac arrest, and then immediately transport your patient. Okay, pulmonary edema is the presence of fluid in the space between the alveoli and the capillaries that surrounds them, interfering with gas exchange. So if you remember a couple slides back, looking at pneumonia, the pus actually builds up in the air sac, okay? So pus would build up inside this air sac, causing the inability of O2 and CO2 to exchange places. However, pulmonary edema is slightly different. The fluid doesn't build up in the air sac. It builds up in the space between the capillary and the air sacs themselves, which again has a similar and almost identical um, obstruction of gas exchange. But given the fact that the fluid is here, you still can't exchange gas. Okay, It's like it ricochets back because you can't exchange the gas through fluid. Same thing as pulmonary edema and pneumonia. All right, so cardiogenic pulmonary edema is typically related to an inadequate pumping function of the left ventricle that drastically increases the pressure in the pulmonary capillaries, which forces fluid to leak into the space between the alveoli and capillary bed and eventually into the alveoli themselves. 
So signs and symptoms of somebody with PE or pulmonary edema, dyspnea or shorter breath on exertion, difficulty in breathing when lying flat, or what we call orthopnea, pink and or frothy sputum, which is a cardiogenic cause only, tachycardia, anxiety, apprehension, combativeness and confusion, tripod position with legs dangling, fatigue, crackles and possible wheezing when you're listening with the stethoscope, which is called auscultation, cyanosis or dusky color skin, pale, moist skin, distended neck veins or JVD, which is a cardiogenic cause only, swollen lower extremities, again, a cardiogenic cause only, cough, fever, symptoms of cardiac compromise, which again is another cardiogenic cause only, and then a decreased, sign, a decreased SAT of 94% or less. And we got to think, what are the treatment needs of patients with pulmonary edema? Okay, if the patient doesn't fit the criteria for CPAP because they deteriorate to respiratory failure or arrest, does not respond to CPAP administration, or has inadequate ventilation, you have to perform bag valve mask ventilation with supplemental oxygen. However, if they are awake and alert, this patient can get CPAP if they can follow commands, which can be extremely beneficial with this patient and prove the most, right, the most help that they're going to get. Now, as far as a pneumothorax, a spontaneous pneumo, which is a portion of the visceral pleura, ruptures without any trauma having been applied to the chest. Think about what would you expect to find in the history and assessment of a patient with a spontaneous pneumo, okay? The visceral pleura ruptures, allowing air to enter the pleural cavity, disrupting its normal negative pressure and causing the lung to collapse, okay? Primary spontaneous pneumothorax occurs in patients in their teenage years to early 20s who are tall and thin. It is thought that the reason these patients are more likely to suffer a spontaneous pneumo is that the visceral pleura is stretched within the chest cavity beyond its normal limit. Many patients of secondary pneumothorax also have a history of cigarette smoking or a connective tissue disorder such as Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. It also occurs in patients who have a history of lung disease or COPD and who are more prone to spontaneous pneumothorax from areas of weakened lung tissue called blebs or boule. The signs and symptoms of a spontaneous pneumothorax have a sudden onset of shortness of breath as well as sharp chest pain or shoulder pain, decreased breath sounds to the one side, okay, tachypnea, diaphoresis, pallor, okay, or a pale type color skin, as well as cyanosis, which is a late sign, or can be a tension pneumothorax. And then a SAT's under 94%. Going to give oxygen and maintain a SAT of 94% or greater, and the patient presents signs and symptoms of respiratory distress, chest pain, or any other indicators for oxygen administration. Positive pressure ventilation with a patient suffering from a pneumothorax must be performed with great care because the pneumothorax could easily be converted into a tension pneumothorax. Use the most minimal tidal volume necessary, and CPAP is most definitely contraindicated in these patients. It is not always possible to distinguish between hyperventilation syndrome due to anxiety and respiratory distress. So due to the medical problem, do not withhold oxygen from the patient despite which one it may be. Somebody with hyperventilation syndrome may appear fatigued, nervous, and anxious, dizziness, shorter breath, definitely, chest tightness, numbness and tingling around the mouth, hands, and feet, tachypnea, tachycardia, spasms of the fingers, feet, causing them to cramp, which is carpopedal spasm, seizures that may be precipitated in a patient with a seizure disorder. Don't have the patient breathe into a paper bag, as you may think, okay? or oxygen mass not connected to oxygen to allow them to rebreathe carbon dioxide. Okay, conditions such as a pulmonary embolus or a myocardial infarction can present similar to a hyperventilation syndrome. So these are two of the conditions in which rebreathing carbon dioxide could be fatal. Okay. The most common cause of epiglottitis in the adult population is hemophilus influenza type B. 
Okay, In epiglottitis, the epiglottis, which is the area around the epiglottis and base of the tongue, becomes severely infected. As the condition progresses, the epiglottis and the structures connected to it are immediately surrounding it, and the base of the tongue become inflamed and swollen, leading to a compromised airway and can result in respiratory compromise. Okay, these patients are going to present with upper respiratory tract infection, usually for one or two days prior to, to its onset. Very short of breath, usually with a more rapid onset. High fever or hyperthermia. Sore throat with a pharyngeal pain. Inability to swallow with drooling, which is a late sign of impending failure. Anxiety as well as apprehension. They're going to be tripoding, along with fatigue, high-pitched inspiratory strider, is an upper airway issue, as well as cyanosis, trouble speaking, or pain during speaking, and then of course a low SAT. If the patient continues to deteriorate and requires assisted ventilations with a BVM, squeeze the bag slowly. This helps direct the air past the obstruction and into the lungs rather than into the esophagus to inflate the stomach. Okay? If this is not effective in ventilating the patient, it is a situation of complete airway obstruction at the level of the epiglottis, and an ALS provider might need to consider other advanced airway techniques. Pertussis. Okay. What is pertussis? It's basically a complication of pertussis, including pneumonia, dehydration, seizures, brain injuries, or infection, ear infections, and even death. Okay. It is a very contagious disease characterized by uncontrolled coughing followed by a whooping cough. Okay? Pertussis is also known as kennel cough in dogs. Okay? It is contagious. Most deaths occur with younger patients who have not been immunized for this disease or with those patients who are exposed before finishing their vaccination series. They may present, there's different stages, all right, with a history of upper respiratory infections, sneezing, runny nose, grade fever, general malaise, or just kind of not feeling well, increased in frequency of severity of coughing, coughing fits, usually more common at night, okay, vomiting, an inspiratory or whoop heard at the end of a coughing burst, possible development of cyanosis during coughing burst because they can't stop the coughing so they're having a hard time breathing, diminishing pulse oximeter finding, exhaustion from expending so much energy while they're trying to cough, trouble speaking and breathing during coughing. Okay, Stage one is common cold Okay, or upper respiratory infection. Stage two, it continues, worsens to the point that medical care is sought. Okay, And then stage three, usual gradual taking several weeks to reach the end of that recovery phase. Following transport with a known suspected pertussis, consider totally disinfecting the back of the patient compartment in the ambulance, as well as possible isolation of yourself for just a little bit. All right, Talk to your healthcare provider and see about any kind of prophylactic medication you might have to get prior to exposing yourself and your family. Cystic fibrosis. It is a chronic disease. Often patients are extremely young. Commonly known history of the disease, recurrent coughing, general malaise, expectoration of thick mucus during coughing, recurrent episodes of history of pneumonia, bronchitis, sinusitis, GI complaints that can include diarrhea, greasy or foul-smelling bowel movements, Okay. Abdominal pain from intestinal gas, malnutrition, or low weight despite a healthy appetite. Dehydration, clubbing of the digits. Okay. Trouble speaking and breathing with mucus buildup. And then, of course, signs of pneumonia. Emergency treatment of a patient suffering from this is geared towards symptomatic relief of the respiratory distress itself. Poisonous exposures. Okay. Commonly, CO2, which is carbon monoxide which is carbon dioxide, CO, which is carbon monoxide, cyanide gas, natural or chlorine gas, liquid chemicals or sprays, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, anesthetic gases, solvents, industrial gases, hydrogen sulfide, fumes, smoke from fires, paints or freon, glue or what's known as toluene, nitrogen dioxide, also known as silo gas, okay, and then amylar butyl nitrate. Okay, they cause upper airway swelling, damage to the alveolar sacs, 
and the effects on the body can be on how it enters the bloodstream and how quickly in the amount that was inhaled. Okay, history of consistent with an inhalation injury. Okay, the presence of chemicals about the face from exposure or things that can give uh, during your assessment we're looking for. Findings of respiratory distress along with cough, strider, wheezing, or crackles. Oral or pharyngeal burns, okay, or possible hoarseness to their voice. Dizziness, feelings of weakness or fatigue or malaise. Headache, confusion, altered mental status along with seizures. Cyanosis or other skin color changes as well as nausea, vomiting, GI pain, copious secretions, lots and lots of drooling, a lot of mucus production in the mouth, and then of course vital sign changes. Because the patient is critical and the patient of the potential for rapid deterioration, try to arrange for ALS intercept and route to the receiving hospital. Okay, provide early notification to the staff at the receiving facility so that it can prepare adequately for your arrival. Position of comfort, high doses of oxygen via non-rebreather unless they get worse. Consider positive pressure ventilation if needed and try to bring with you the material that they inhaled or took. Viral infections are commonly referred to as upper respiratory infections by the medical community because most symptoms are found in the nose and throat. In small children, however, VRIs can also come in forms of infection of the lower airway structures such as the trachea, bronchial, bronchioles, or lungs. These patients are going to have nasal congestion, sore or scratchy throat, mild respiratory distress or coughing, usually a fever greater than 101, malaise, headaches, and body aches, irritability in infants and poor feeding habits, tachypnea, exacerbation of the asthma patient if patient has that disease. Supplemental oxygen is given, occasionally mechanical ventilation depending on how bad they are, and then make sure ALS is en route to intercept. Okay. Beta-2 agonist or meter dose inhalers or a small volume nebulizer is usually given to relax the smooth muscle in the bronchioles. Meter dose inhalers are much more convenient, but some patients use small volume nebulizers at home. Most bronchodilators begin to work almost immediately and their effects can last up to eight hours or more. Because of the swift relief they can provide, they are appropriate for pre-hospital administration by EMTs with approval of medical direction. Okay, this is an example of a spacer in the orange, yellow, and the blue, and the green is your meter dose inhaler. Usually one compression of the device gives you the amount of medication that is prescribed. Okay, meter dose inhalers may be used with a spacer, and then here is your small volume nebulizer. Okay, the kit can be used with a mask or with the pipe set up as you see at the top. Many respiration medications are administered by meter dose inhaler or nebulizers, but not all are appropriate. Okay, therefore bronchodilators are only administered by physician order, online or offline. Okay. Some of the medications that they use are listed here, as you can see. Some are albuterol, metaproterol, okay, epitromium bromide, levalbuterol, depending on what you're prescribed by the physician. Okay, these all are bronchodilators, so it just depends on what the patient has been given. All of the following criteria, though, have to be met before you can administer. They have to exhibit the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress as well as have a physician-prescribed inhaler or a nebulizer, okay? The EMT has to be received approval from medical direction, whether online or offline, to administer the medication. Okay, the bronchodilator given should be, patient is not responsive, okay? Should not be given, okay? So we're not gonna be given this by mouth at all. If the patient isn't responsive, okay? If it's not prescribed, if medical direction has not given permission, and the patient has already taken the maximum allowed dose prior to your arrival. The side effects okay, can be tachycardia, fast heart rate, some kind of jitteriness or nervous tremors, dry mouth, nausea, vomiting. Okay. However, if they take it and it works, as following in your chart in your book, Chapter 16, Table 16-3, they're going to become more alert, a better respiratory effort, as well as a reduction in their initial complaint. Okay, so we're going to check for the patient's prescription. We're going to make sure that they have it. It's prescribed to them. Then we're going to call over the radio for orders to use it. 
Okay, ensure that it's the right patient, right medication, right dose, right route, and right date. The five R's of drug administration. Determine if the patient is alert enough to use the inhaler and if any doses have already been administered. Ensure the inhaler is at room temperature. Shake vigorously for 30 seconds. Have the patient place the lips around the mouthpiece of the inhaler. Have the patient begin to slowly and deeply inhale over about five seconds. Do not depress the canister before the patient begins to inhale because this would allow the majority of the medication to be lost into the air and it will not reach the lower respiratory tract. Remove the inhaler. Have the patient hold their breath. Count to 10. And then have them exhale slowly. Put the oxygen mask back on your patient and have them continue to breathe as best possible. Reassess, check for improvement, recheck your vital signs, okay? Same thing with a spacer. Only difference is you're going to have the patient put their mouth around the end of the spacer. The medication gets injected into the spacer, and then they, if they can't, then they're able to breathe in the medication from the chamber. The chamber holds the medication to prevent it from being lost into the air. Okay, as far as nebulizers are concerned, we're going to make sure we're giving the right, again, right patient, right medication, right dose, right route, right date. Typical adult dose for albuterol via nebulizer is 5 milligrams. You're going to make sure you read the dose. You place it in the nebulizer chamber itself, okay, with either online or offline direction, depending on the service you work for. Okay, then you're going to replace the top. Attach the corrugated tubing, attach the oxygen to the bottom, then you're going to attach the mouthpiece, then you're going to have the patient breathe, okay, and we're going to turn this up to anywhere from 6 to 8 liters a minute on your uh, regulator on your O2 tank. Okay, have them breathe in as deep as they can and exhale as long as they can. Have them continue to do this, and then if they can't do this, then you can always put this and attach it to a mask and then attach the mask to the patient. Okay, some of the medications that you might see in the field is Advair, which is only a short-acting beta-2 agonist drug that should be used in the emergency care of the patient experiencing an acute asthma attack. It is not a rescue inhaler. It is a maintenance inhaler, okay? But it does contain a crushed pill that is a steroid, okay? For pediatric patients, okay, respiratory failure is a very common cause of respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. So common causes of upper airway obstruction and lower airway diseases can cause this. Respiratory failure for the pediatric patient is defined as an inadequate oxygenation of blood and an inadequate elimination of carbon dioxide from the body. Okay, so scene size up, we're looking for clues to rule out trauma, making sure that we have any labored or noisy breathing in the child who's sitting up in a tripod position, lying limply or unresponsive. Increased use of accessory muscles, tachypnea, tachycardia, nasal flaring or prolonged exhalation, cyanosis to the extremities, altered mental status, slow heart rate, slow blood pressure, okay, slow, fast, or an irregular breathing pattern, and then loss of muscle tone. They become limp. Allow the child to assume a position of comfort, maybe in the parent's lap or holding. Don't remove the infant or child from their parent or other caretaker. Apply the oxygen as needed. Okay. Sometimes the parent may have to do it because they may be scared of what you're trying to give them. So just whatever way is possible for them to be able to keep the mask on their face, have mom, dad, or caretaker do it. Okay. As far as respiratory failure in the pediatric patient, if the blockage was sudden and there was something around the child could have swallowed, all right, then we have to think that's a possibility. It could be croup or epiglottitis. But again, your assessment plays a crucial part in determining what the cause of the respiratory failure is. Be prepared to intervene more aggressively if the condition deteriorates. Okay. The chest wall is more compliant in pediatric patients and less compliant with geriatric patients. Okay, so their diseases can progress rapidly from respiratory distress to respiratory failure. Many of the signs and symptoms or breathing difficulty can be spotted as you form your general impression during your primary assessment. The signs and symptoms of respiratory distress usually briefly precede respiratory failure in the geriatric patients. Older patients do not have the compensatory mechanism younger adults do and typically have an increased use of accessory muscles to breathe, sternal and intercostal, retractions during inspiration, as well as tachypnea, tachycardia, 
some nasal flaring, prolonged exhalation, frequent coughing, cyanosis, anxiety, confusion, as well as an inability to speak in full sentence.